Okay, real quick, while I got your attention.
Welcome to Truvine, the warm and friendly church where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord. All right, guys, so anyway, the people didn't know. Uh... What's up, everybody? We're so glad that you're here. Our prayer for you today is that the Lord may fill you with the knowledge of his will so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. If you don't have a church home, we would love to have you join us here at The Vine. Please complete the connect form on the website and we'll connect with you this week. Give us a shout out in the comments below. Let us know where you're from and how we can pray for you. And please don't just watch the service. Join in, sing with us, pray with us, listen to the word with us. It's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is the day that the Lord has made. I don't know about you, but I will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I call to worship scriptures this morning is found in Psalms 34, 33 rather, verses 1 through 4. If you can't stand, do so as we share together the word of God and then go into prayer. What a beautiful day it is to be alive. The Bible says, shout for the joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him. A new song, play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. Somebody ought to give God a hand praise. Father, how we rejoice today for this another day that you have made. Our hearts are made glad, God, because you woke us up this morning and started us on our way. Father, we've come into this place for one purpose, that is to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, would your Holy Spirit come in, take over all that we do, all that we say. Make our hearts glad today in the Lord. God, may your will be done. Will you save lost souls as we gather today? Would you encourage that heart that is discouraged in the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Accept our praise on this wonderful morning. We ask it all now in the name that is above every name. That is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And all the people of God shouted, praise the Lord. Come on, you can do better than that. The Lord. If you know the Lord is good, and if you really know if it had not been for the Lord on your side, you would not be here. You ought to be able to shout, praise the Lord. Come on and join us as we worship the Lord together in song. Oh Lord, we worship you today. Oh, Lord, we lift our hands in praise to you today. Oh, Lord, you're worthy of all the praise and all the glory. Because you are Lord. You are Lord. Oh, Lord, we lift our hands in praise. 
praise to you today. Oh Lord, you're worthy of all our praise today. Oh yes, you are, cause you are Lord. You are Lord. Now everybody open up your mouth and say, there is only one name. There is only one name. There is only one name. With power to say. With power to say. With power to say. With power to say. Come on, open up your mouth and say, There is only one name. There is only one name. There is only one name. With power to say, come on, say this with us. Our God is champion. Our God is champion. He reigns. He reigns forevermore. 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 Forevermore.
journey through a passage that reminds us something that good friends and neighbors ought to want all their loved ones to know. Here it is. Even though there's a lot going wrong in the world and even in our lives, when it's all said and done, Jesus is going to make everything new. But before Jesus makes everything new, he's going to make everything right. Would you stand with me and turn to the back of your Bible, to the book of Revelation, John's Apocalypse, Revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 19. We'll begin reading today at verse 11 and end at verse 21. While you're turning there, listen, I know a lot of us shy away from this book because of the vivid images of judgment and justice within. But I want you to know today that when you rightly understand the book of Revelation, all of those images and all of that stuff that seems scary is designed to highlight three things. How holy God is. How horrible sin is. And how hopeful the church is. And if you're here today, you need to know, if you are a child of God, you've got a glorious future to look forward to and you have nothing to fear. But if you have not trusted Jesus, you don't have anything good to look forward to and you have much to fear. Revelation 19, begin reading at verse 11. Before I begin reading, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you that this is the word of God. Then I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and, all the, fl and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done signs by which the beast and those who worshipped its image, but deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. 
these two were thrown alive into the lake that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged on their flesh. Again, verse 11 says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. I want to talk today about Jesus wins. Would you help me preach today and tell your neighbor that? Jesus wins. You didn't know you were preaching today, but that's the gospel. Tell your neighbor again, Jesus wins. Have you ever heard the term spoiler alert? Uh, it's when discussing a film or TV show, a book maybe, that an important detail of the plot is about to be disclosed. It's a warning. The book of Revelation should come with a tag in bold letters that says, spoiler alert. Because one of its main functions is to disclose the important details of the plot of last things and the ultimate end of human history. To comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable, Revelation gives us a spoiler alert, not only of our lives, but of all God's purposes and plans. By the time we reach the back half of chapter 19, all seven of the churches have been addressed. All seven seals on the title deed of the universe have been broken. All seven trumpets have been sounded by the assigned angels and all seven bowls of wrath have been poured out. Revelation 19 is perhaps the most climactic scene in the drama of creation and redemption. It describes the beginning of the end. It gives us clues about how everything concludes. And if you've ever wondered What's the world coming to? If you've watched the news and asked, how are things going to turn out? If you've been on YouTube and listening to podcasts and putting your stock in conspiracy theories, this text begs for your attention. In the midst of a lingering pandemic, a polarized political climate, a divided church on issues of race and righteousness, hate-filled and demonically influenced mass shootings, sexuality and gender confusion, economic inflation, and the possible threat of World War III. Maybe you found yourself weary, worried, or wounded. In this text, breathed out by the Spirit and penned by John, God tells us where it's all leading. Your life and my life, every event in the history of time and eternity, every war, every injustice, every sin, every human agenda that stands against God, it's all coming to this. Here's how it all ends. Despite the suffering, the sin, and the seeming success of evil structures, systems, and schemes, no matter how bad it looks today, no matter what the news headlines say tomorrow, here's what it's all coming to. Jesus wins. This passage details Christ's return to face off with the devil's counterfeit trinity and the evil armies of the earth. This is called by many theologians the battle or the war of Armageddon. 
the final fight of all eternity shows that Jesus has no equals, no peers, and no worthy rivals. Rich with imagery and illusions and metaphors, this text vividly describes Christ's return and ultimate victory over evil in three powerful movements. I want to show you the structure of the passage so that you can walk with me as we journey through. Each movement is marked by the phrase, I saw. John says it in verse 11. You still got your Bible open? Verse 17 and verse 19. John sees a vision in three parts that is designed to declare that in the end, Jesus wins. The Lord Jesus Christ will come again in glory, majesty, and power to judge those who reject him and defeat those who oppose him. Because in the end, Jesus wins, here's God's call upon your life today. Rely on him and win with him or reject him and lose to him. Rely on him and win with him or reject Jesus and lose to him. Here's the text message today. If, you, if you're taking notes, here's the, the point of the passage. Christ's victory in the end encourages us to endure right now. Question is, what details does the text give concerning Jesus' victory in the end? First of all, in the end, Christ's victory will be certain. This first movement describes a pre-battle victory parade. John sees heaven open and Christ descending on a white horse. This scene is a sanctified reimagining of what was called the Roman triumphant procession. In that day, Rome celebrated its conquest by having extravagant and elaborate victory parades. The general would ride in front on a white horse and his soldiers and surviving enemies would ride behind him. Well, John sees and describes a pre-battle triumphant procession, but it's not on the horizontal plane of earth. It is a vertical descending parade. Jesus is the warrior general and the armies of heaven are riding behind him and listen every detail of this scene proves the certainty of his victory before the battle in verse 11 John lays the foundation of the identity and activity of Christ he says he is called faithful and true this speaks to his character. Faithful means dependable. He can be trusted to do what is right. True means credible. He speaks truth and does what he says he will do. And then the fact that he judges and makes war speaks of his activity because he is dependable and credible. Here's what you got to know about Jesus. Nothing he ever does and no decision he ever makes can be called into question. There's no court of appeals high enough to overturn his verdicts. He never makes mistakes 
And unlike us, and unlike Satan and his unholy team, Jesus makes war for the right reasons against the right enemies. Reason why John introduces the writer this way is because what he's coming to do should not be seen as cruel or unusual punishment. It will be the judgment and justice and righteous indignation of God Almighty. Now these foundational descriptions are further developed in verses 12 through 16. John sees seven details that display the fullness and perfection of who Christ is and what he's coming to do. I want to show them to you. John says, look at his eyes, his head, his clothes, his names, his army, his mouth, and his purpose. The first four apply to his identity. The last three apply to his activity. Look at his eyes. Like flames of fire. This recalls John's first vision of Jesus in the book of Revelation in chapter 1, verse 14. And what it suggests is that he sees all and judges all. Look at his head. He's wearing many diadems. In chapter 12, verse 3 of Revelation, Satan the dragon wears seven crowns. But here, Christ has an innumerable number of crowns that suggest his jurisdiction is over all other crowns. He has sovereign authority. Look at his clothes. He's clothed in a robe, baptized in blood. Now, there are two schools of thought about whose blood this is, I won't solve that for you, but I'll give you what the debate is. Here, here it is, watch this. Either this is his blood and it points back to his sacrifice on the cross as the means of victory, or this is the blood of his enemies before the battle pointing to the certainty of his victory. But then look at his names. We're given a trinity of names for Jesus in this text. Three references to his different names. Verse 12 says, written on his crowns is a name no one knows. Which means he has sovereign anonymity. In Jewish thought, the name reflected the full character of a person. Therefore, the forces of evil do not grasp who they are preparing to fight. Here's what John is saying. John says they don't know who they are messing with. Because he's got a name that nobody knows but himself. And then, then verse 13, his name is the word of God. This is beautiful because the same author who's writing Revelation wrote the Gospel of John. And he began the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was... He, and, and now he calls his name the Word of God to say that this one on this horse is the revealer of God. But then the third reference to his name is down in verse 16. The inscription on his robe and it's tattooed on his thigh reads King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which says he has absolute authority over everything and everyone. Caesar is not in control. Satan is not in control. The Antichrist is not in control. The president is not in control. The Supreme Court is not in control. All authority 
belongs to him. But then look at his army. The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses of their own. White linen robes are used to describe both angels and saints in the whole book of Revelation. And I contend that this army includes both holy angels and redeemed humanity. Spoiler alert, we're in the parade with Jesus. As his sanctified soldiers, we will accompany Christ as he comes to judge the forces of evil. But then look at his mouth. Sharp mouth sword symbolizes the power of his word. He uses it to strike the nations. This is a preview of what he's getting ready to do. Because of the power of the truth in his mouth, he will rule them with a rod of iron. This is an echo of the messianic psalm, Psalm 2, that suggests divine discipline for God's flock and protection from God's foes. He's going to do it all with his word. Stick a pin there, we're coming back to it. And then lastly, here's the seventh thing John saw. He said, look at his purpose. Why is he coming? He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. This is a picture of someone stomping their feet in a wine press until the grapes are crushed and the juice fills up. It's an echo of, of Isaiah 63 in which Christ is the servant of the Lord who carries out his judgment against the nations. The same way grapes were crushed in a wine press, God's enemies will be trampled under his feet. If you want to know how certain his victory is, John says, look at his eyes. Look at his head. Look at his clothes. Look at his names, his army, mouth, and purpose. This triumphal procession from heaven to earth takes place not after the battle, but before the battle. Jesus knows how to make an entrance. I said Jesus knows. Are there any witnesses here today that he knows how to make an entrance? Has he ever showed up for you right on time? He knows how to make an entrance and who he is and what he does is proof that it's impossible for him not to win. He will be victorious. For those of us, for those of you who have not trusted Christ, the time is now. Hear me today, brothers and sisters. Tomorrow is not promised. He could come back at any moment, and when he arrives, it's going to be too late. But for those of us who have trusted Christ, in these dark times, his return should fill our hearts with confidence and expectation. Here's why. His victory is our victory. And let me ask you today, are you fighting anything? You facing anything that's too big for you to handle? You got any issues in your life or in your family or in your community that you need the Lord to solve? His victory is our victory, but it's victory by association, not participation. We're on his team, but he don't need our help. NBA Finals are going on right now. Boston Celtics versus the Golden State Warriors. And if you're a fan of Boston and they win, are you going to say Boston won or are you going to say we won? 
If you're a fan of the Golden State Warriors and they win, are you going to say the Warriors won? Or are you going to say we won? You're going to say we won, but that's an announcement of a victory by association, not participation. Come on. You ain't, you, you ain't been to a single practice. You ain't played in a single game, but you're still going to say we won because of your relationship with the team. I'm trying to tell you this morning that because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, in the end, we won't swing a single sword. We won't exert any energy, but we'll be able to testify we won because we're on his team. We win just because we're associated with him. The Lord's side is the best side. I said the Lord's side is the best side. And here's the good news. He's never lost a battle. And he never will. How do I know it? Because he's already won this battle. And it ain't even happened yet. Christ's victory is certain. Can I show you something else? Christ's victory in the second part of the vision. John sees in verse 17 and 18. Christ's victory will be complete. This second movement describes a pre-battle invitation to a victory banquet. John looks again and he sees an angel standing in the sun. Now this is apocalyptic symbolic language to say that from the angle John is looking, it seems as though the angel that's flying in the middle of the air is actually standing in the sun. It looks like an angelic eclipse. And he says with a loud voice, the angel called to all the birds that fly in the air, come gather for the great supper of God. You got to understand the background here because after every Roman triumph parade, there was a victory banquet. Because Christ's victory will be complete, the invitations to the banquet are sent before the battle. <laughs> Ain't nothing like the word of God. I, I wish y'all could see this thing. The angel invites the birds to dine on the flesh of God's enemies. This imagery is designed, please hear me, is designed to turn your stomach. You're supposed to feel like you're watching a horror movie when you read it. It's meant to highlight the fact that evil is real. And one day, Jesus is going to put an end to it. Do we need that word today? Mass shootings. Where babies are being killed that woke up that day just to go to school. Police killing people left and right. Political upheaval. I mean, we're in the middle of Pride Month after all. Do, do we need this word today yes, to know that Jesus is coming and he's going to make things right? It's almost, it's also meant to challenge you to make sure that you don't end up on the wrong side of the fight. And, and that's, really, that's really why I came today. I came to encourage those of us who are already on the Lord's side. And I pray God will help me preach long enough and loud enough to push somebody else to the right side of the battle. The vultures are invited to feast 
without reservation. Look at this. The flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, horses and riders, all men, both free, slaves, small and great. All the flesh of his enemies being eaten by the birds means Christ's victory will be complete. No level of socioeconomic, political, or religious status will exempt those who have rejected Christ from being prey to the vultures. I've started getting weekly updates from several Christian organizations about the cruelty of the war in Ukraine. I get these in hopes to inform my prayers for those that are suffering. But I read some stats this week, estimated that nearly 28,000 civilians have been wounded or killed. Over 10,000 within the Ukrainian forces and 15 to 20,000 Russian and allied forces have been killed or wounded. Now, I don't know if these numbers are accurate, their estimations, but I do know what most wars have in common. There are always casualties on both sides. Oh, but this text contains a battle. This text contains a war with casualties on only one side. Christ's victory over evil is so complete, defeating human and spiritual forces, that there will be no casualties on his side and a total loss on the other side. No enemy of God will be left standing. Now you got to back out of, here, out of this part of, of Revelation and see how this text connects to the rest of the chapter because the great supper of God here in verse 17 and 18 is meant to contrast the marriage supper of the Lamb in verses 6 through 10 in this same chapter. chapter. Those who serve God and have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. But the great supper of God is reserved for the meat-eating birds of the air. The marriage banquet is a symbol of everlasting joy. But this victory banquet is a symbol of everlasting judgment. The first banquet is salvation, but the second banquet is judgment. John is saying, either trust the lamb now and feast with him later, or refuse him today and be eaten by the birds tomorrow. These two suppers remind us, brothers and sisters, that even though we all look different, dress different, come from different places, make different amounts of money, have different educational backgrounds, there are really only two types of people in the world. Please hear me today. Those redeemed by Christ and those who have rejected Jesus Christ. This contrast is meant to encourage the saved and evangelize the lost. Saints ought to rejoice, but sinners need to repent because in the end, Jesus wins. I'm moving on, but, but my question is, what banquet will you attend? Christ has come down with all the armies of heaven. The Antichrist and the counterfeit spirit have assembled the greatest army the world has ever seen, made up of human and demonic forces. This is light versus darkness, life versus death, good versus evil, heaven versus hell. This dramatic scene is a stage set for the grandest and most brutal of all battles, but surprisingly, there is no battle. 
You may have read the text too fast, but look in your Bible again. The shift from verse 19 to verse 20 is so abrupt, it's as if something's missing. Both sides are lined up for battle, and out of nowhere, the beast and the false prophet were captured and thrown into the lake of fire, and all the, and all the flesh of men were eaten by the birds. Just like that, the battle is over. But it's so sudden, it's like John left something out. Or like our Bibles were edited poorly. And I assure you they were not. It was written just like that. The abrupt shift shows that the battle ends just as soon as it begins. I mean, there's more text devoted to the outcome of the battle than the battle itself. It's such a conclusive victory that the results are more important than the actions. I'm, I'm a boxing fan. Any boxing fans in the house? I'm a boxing fan. And if you're a boxing fan, you know this, that before every fight, the commentators on the telecast give you what's called the tail of the tape. That includes each fighter's height, weight, reach, victories, losses, strengths, weaknesses, that kind of a thing. That's before every fight. But after every fight, they give a post-fight recap. That shows the scorecards, the punches thrown and landed, knockdowns, and the winner and the loser. Well, when you read this text, verse 19 shows us the pre-fight tale of the tape. And 20 and 21 show us the post-fight recap. But there's no fight in between. No action in the middle. Jesus wins the fight without fighting. He just opens his mouth. And his word does all the work. Now this is significant because in the book of Revelation, Satan and the beast are going to deceive the world into opposing God with their slanderous, poisonous words. But Jesus defeats evil, deception and lies with the power of his word. I wish you were glad about that today. You see, just as in Genesis, when God created and called everything good through a speech event, here in Revelation, the defeat of everything evil will be a speech event. The only weapon Jesus uses is the sword in his mouth. His word is enough. Anybody glad today that his word is enough? The text doesn't tell us what he said. But it does let us know that Jesus will have the last word. I said Jesus will have the last word. His victory is so conclusive because Jesus is going to have the last word against sin. Jesus is going to have the last word over sickness. Jesus is going to have the last word over death over evil, over abuse, over racism, over injustice, over poverty, over cancel culture, over family trauma, and over all your pain. Anybody glad today that Jesus is going to have the last word? Oh, bless his name. We live in a dualistic world where it always seems like one person against another. Yeah. One group against another. Yeah. One political party. Yes, one country. Yeah. One race. Yeah. One gender. One sexual preference. Yeah. Whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, one 
against the other. But at the core of every conflict is the struggle between good and evil. Righteousness and wickedness, light and darkness, life and death. And when Jesus comes, he will put an end to evil and provide peace for his people. He will right every wrong. He's going to balance every book and overrule every injustice. Anybody glad today that he's going to heal every sickness? and wipe away every tear. I know it's dark right now. I know it's hard right now. I know it's painful right now. But God sent me to tell you, hold on just a little while longer. Keep the faith and don't give up. Because in the end, Jesus wins. Good morning, True Vine. May the Lord bless you real good. But the message of the passage is twofold. If you're not a believer, don't wait until the battle is over. Repent and believe right now. Because in the end, Jesus wins. And if you are a believer, don't wait till the battle is over. Shout right now. Rejoice right now. Give him glory right now. Because in the end, hey, in the end, Jesus wins. When you're burdened down with the cares of life and you feel all hope is gone, don't despair. God will be right there. When the battle is over, we're going home. When the tears are streaming down, and there's no one around, and your striving seems in vain. Hold your head up high. Your deliverance is nigh. When the battle is over, we're going home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout right now, because in the end, Jesus wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the end. Anybody know who wins? In the end. Jesus wins. The preacher asked an important question throughout the message one I hope all of us heard and are able to answer the question was which side are you on here's the thing about the Bible and the Bible does not allow us to take a neutral position now now the world wants us to just take a neutral position the world kind of wants you to stand on the spiritual Mason Dixie line y'all know what I mean yes yes the world wants you today to wait to decide the message of Satan is you got time. You got plenty of time. I mean, look at you. Young and healthy. Heartbeat is strong. You got plenty of time. Life has just started for most of you. Others of us are like, well, I'm just in, you know, I'm in my prime. The truth of the matter is, friends, we are reminded every day. Life teaches us, if our eyes are open, that people of all ages die every day. Young people die. Old people like me die. Middle-aged folk die. Truth of the matter is, we're all going to leave here one day. 
the Bible, God's word says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and then after that, the judgment. So, so, at, so at some point, all of us are going to have to stand before God. We're going to have to be able to say, were you on God's side? If you're on God's side, you win by, everybody say, association. You ain't made a slam dunk in your life. You ain't never hit a home run. But if your team win, you win by, I, I love that analogy, I love that. You win by association. And my Bible reminds me that I am more than a conqueror. Come on saints, where are my saints at? We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. That, that means what? We conquer because of our association with Christ. Now, can I just throw this in? There's some folk claiming association. And to your surprise, one day the Lord's going to say to you, depart from me, because I never knew you. Imagine that. You claiming to be Christian and God say, I don't know you. Well, I went to Truvine, and <laughs> I was a member at Life Church. And your point is, no, no. Some people are claiming association. I baptized, man. I, I raised in the church. I, I might be talking to somebody here today. You, 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 you've been raised in the church. You know better, but you ain't living better. It's by God's grace that you are here today. That's God saying, look here. I'm going to give you a chance to start over. Yeah, you've blown it. You're like the rest of us. We've all blown it. But the fact that you're here today, I'm giving you one more chance. Listen, listen. To get on the winning team. My wife and I were chuckling the other day. You ever notice something about sports writers? Their tune changes with every game played. When Golden State lost the first game, you know what they said? They finished. Then when Golden State won the second game, oh, Boston's in trouble. Every game, they changed their tune. Now we knotted up two to two. Today, friends, as you stand before God's, God's word today, it's knotted up. It's, it's knotted up. Today, you got to choose whose side you're on. If you don't know Christ, the word of God assures us, whosoever shall call upon the name of of the Lord shall be saved. And God will save you. I don't care what nobody else think about you. God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son that if you believe in him, you can win also. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In our church, we don't want to put anybody on the spot. So you don't have to walk these aisles today to come to Christ. The deacons in this church, myself included, other members of our church. Anybody you see with a green shirt on in here or a True Vine ministry shirt, you can Approach them in the lobby after church and say, look, that's me. I want to be saved. Can you tell me how that happens? Can, can you help me connect with Christ today? And they'll be glad to. 
You can find me after service. I'll be in the lobby. We don't want to put you on the spot, but we do want to say, today you will make a choice. You will either accept Christ as your Savior and be on the winning team, or you will reject Christ today and leave here as one who one day will face him as your judge. I hope you'll come to Christ today. And to that end, I'm going to pray for us now. Father, thank you so much for your word and the messenger who shared with us that Jesus wins in the end. Thank you, God, that today you made it clear that those who want to be on his side can come without money, come without price. We can just come freely, confess our sin, be willing to repent of our sin, declare that we believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. Without him, there is no way to get to heaven. I pray even now that the Holy Spirit would touch every heart, move and convict every soul that needs salvation to make that decision now. We stand with them and against Satan whose goal is to keep them lost, who's to keep them in darkness. Oh God, save them, give them boldness and give them courage and Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Draw them to thyself. May they connect with me or some other member here and we'll be happy to lead them in prayer. Oh God, thank you again for your word and the power therein. Lord, would you continue to bless this preacher and his ministry and his family. And we'll be so careful to give you all of the glory and all of the praise. All the people of God said amen. Hello, friends. This is Pastor Cal. Thank you so much for joining us today in worship. I hope that you found the message to be a blessing to you uh, and your family. If you haven't subscribed to our page, can I encourage you to do so? That way, anytime we're alive, you'll be notified. I believe every Christian ought to be a part of the local church. And so if you don't have a church home, man, we would love to have you come and join us uh, at Team True Vine. In this time that we're living, friends, you don't have to be local to be live. You don't have to be local to join us as a member. Go to our website. The link is provided below. You'll find more information about our church. You'll also find there the platforms that we have if you'd like to give financial support to this church and to this ministry. We love to have you. We are the warm, friendly church where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you again for your time. Hope that you'll come back and join us the next time we are live. Until then, friends, go with God and he will go with you.